This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Next episode of 40 Watt Podcast. I appreciate you coming and checking us out and hanging out and listening. Before we get started, I'm going to mention a couple of things that I, I haven't been mentioning in a while, but I wanted to throw them out there. Uh, you heard at the top of the episode, uh, I have my partnership with True Fire. Please click lessons. Go there before you buy new gear. My guest today doesn't like me saying that, but before you buy new gear, Check out some lessons, get some get some uh, better technique under your fingers, find some new voices, find some new chords, some new scales, some new cool stuff. Um, also, there is a Patreon for this podcast. The Patreon is how I keep this continuing to happen. I've got some pretty incredible Patreon supporters whose names I will read out at the end of the episode and thank them for their support. Um, we've got a Discord for this uh, podcast where we all go over there and chat and, you know, peer pressure each other into buying gear it's a great place it's a fun time um uh last but not least there are some other ways you can support the podcast you can go to the links uh down below there are some links for affiliate links for reverb.com there are some uh other ways that you can buy some merch i've never i don't talk about the merch much because i want to update it but there is some stuff there i uh, appreciate all your support now done Going to, going straight into this episode, I'm uh, today I'm talking to Silas Caldwell of Cald Caldwell Guitars Nashville. I'm putting that in there because that's in the tag there, and it's probably a good tag because I bet you're not the only Caldwell Guitars nationally. Probably not. I mean, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure there's a few Caldwells out there, you know, rocking. Oh yeah. So Silas, you are a uh, Nashville-based singer guitarist. And also guitar shop owner. So uh, we're going to take a step back. Let's let's talk about who you are, how you got into what you're doing. Let's give that backstory a little bit of how did you get into playing guitar, and then how did you decide, hey, you know, we should start a guitar store in Nashville. Yeah, well, I'm uh, my name is Silas. Uh, I'm 15 years old, and uh, I'm based in Nashville. Um, I do a little bit of you know what I'm able to, I guess, which is play music. Um, I play guitar. I do a little bit of vocals. Uh, I just play some shows around town. And then uh, I now um, call Will Guitars Nashville. Yeah. So um, now a lot of people are right now. Wait, I thought he said he's 15. Yes, y'all heard that right. He's 15, owns, he and his, his dad, Tony, co-own a guitar store in Nashville called Caldwell Guitars Nashville. Super cool store. If you're in the Nashville area, you absolutely need to stop by for uh, YouTube viewers. I'm actually drinking out of a Caldwell Guitars mug. Um, so not that long ago, just a few weeks ago, I was in town. Uh, the Bros Landreth were playing there at City Winery. I was in town, you know, use, doing my usual haunts, stopping in guitar stores. And um, uh, I stopped by Caldwell because I had not been there yet. Came in, started chatting, realized... Hey, you know, got to talking to your dad, Tony, uh, realized he's from Tupelo. You know, I'm from I'm living in Starkville. I'm from the Delta. You you come out, we get to talk and we start talking about all the same like players we've played with, same folks we know. It was a really cool, like small world moment. So at uh, we're because we want to talk about this in a couple of different ways. You've just released some music not too long ago, if I remember reading correctly. So we want to talk about the music that you've released, but I also want to talk about the whole how do you get into 
starting a music store in Nashville at 15? Because the when your dad told me, it's like, no, this was Silas's idea. This is what he wanted to do. So how'd that, how'd that happen that you decided I wanted to do that? So with the music store, I guess it started um, May of 2020, where, uh, you know, we were two months into the pandemic. And, uh, you know, it was a tough time for everybody. And uh, my dad has just been, you know, buying, selling, and trading gear for a long time. He never owned a store uh, at any point, but he was doing it online through like sources like Reverb and uh, other places like that. And um, in May of 2020, he wanted to uh, sell some gear. And I was like, okay, let's set up a Reverb shop. And then off the top of my head, you know, because the normal like Reverb shop name is like, Tony's Gear Bazaar or right. like Tony's Gear Shop or whatever it gives you. So I think I'm like, mine was Phillips Gear Garage for a long time. Yeah. And I was like, uh, let's just give it a cool name. And I'm like, okay, Cole Guitars Nashville. Um, and so it was born really, you know, it was just casual. We were casually, you know, buying and selling gear on there. Um, yeah, as you do. Yeah. And just, you know every now and then getting something special for us and then selling the other stuff. And, uh, that's really how we, uh, got onto reverb. And then, um, in November of 21, we got, uh, started about call guitars, Nashville, cause my band, our guitar players had just moved to Florida. And, oh, wow. uh, I was like, uh, this is interesting. So we, uh, we're like, okay, let's get serious about opening a guitar shop. Cause me and my dad, you know, we're very close. We have a lot, you know, in common as father and son do, but I mean, he's a musician. Uh, we love a lot of the same artists, stuff like that. And we were like, let's do a guitar shop together. Let's take call guitars, Nashville, and just do a little father son project together. Uh, and we opened up in February and oh. it, it was uh it was awesome. I mean, there were some great people coming in. RJ, who's been on the podcast before, came in. Um I hadn't seen RJ in about a year, uh, because we had played at a charity benefit together uh about a year earlier. Uh but he's a very awesome guy, and he's actually got some of his gear on consignment at the shop right now. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, so taking that step from Reverb Store to Brick and Mortar, that's a that's a huge leap. Uh, especially in a town like Nashville, where there are a lot of music stores. And it's not that there's just a lot of music stores. There's a lot of really good music stores. Uh was there any like, I don't know, any like moment where you're like, I'm not sure that we should do this? Or was it like, no, this is going to be awesome. We're going to do this. This is fun. Well, I think everyone gets a little worried when they're starting their first business or starting a small business, um, mm -hmm. especially with the financial responsibility, which luckily my dad was willing to uh, go in with me on this and help me out, uh, mm -hmm. which of course was a big help. <laughs> and then... Uh, you know, I just think as far as music stores in Nashville, everyone's doing something different, honestly. Um, there are some great music stores there, some of the best in the world, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I just think, you know, guitar stores are my favorite thing. And to put, I've been wanting to open a business since I was really little, uh, you know, like some of my earliest memories were like, oh, I want to open like a restaurant or something <laughs> like that, you know, like we all do at some as, point. As someone who used to work in bar and restaurant management, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Not in this day and age, at least. Uh, mm -mm. Man. In this economy? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Not kidding, but I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, and you're right. There's like... That's what I love about Nashville. I just love Nashville in general. I've already always said that that's like my retirement town. Like that's where I want to go to retire. It's like right now I, I, I'm doing other things in other fields and, and there's not a place for it. But like I lived in Murfreesboro for a little while. And so I lived in, in that Nashville area, spent a lot of time in Nashville. 
it's it, one, it's a city, although it does a lot more now. It didn't used to feel like a city. You know, it felt like this small town kind of feel still. Uh, a little bit of that still there, but, you know, the cranes kind of give it away um, as a city. But every music store has its own vibe. They're totally their own thing, you know. Um, you know, when I first started going, when I lived in Nashville, I would go to uh, Rock Block Guitars, which does not exist anymore. Um, that used to be over uh, near Exit Inn in the end and uh, that area, that whole rock block area. And that's where I first discovered Mesa Boogie. That's where I discovered Matchless, where I discovered Bad Cat. Um, but then, you know, after I moved away and started going back to Nashville, that's when I discovered, you know, and Carter Vintage is there now, which, you know, has its thing. And Fanny's has its thing. And Eastside has its thing. And then there's a uh, rumble seat, which that's a whole other vibe. Uh, and it's so cool that all of them sort of coexist in this musical economy of gear. And so when I stop by y'all's place, y'all have got this very like living room vibe, like this, like sitting down at a friend's house to talk about and hang out in gear. And oh yeah, you can buy it while you're here. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the fill, uh, it's just a very creative space where you can be with people, you know, that think the same as you in a way, yeah. or at least what we all have in common. If you're going in there is, I guess you love music. If you're wanting to buy a guitar or, uh, you know, it's just a great space to be. There's a great energy in that room. I knew it from the moment that we first walked in there. I'm like, this room is small, but we're going to make the most of it. And it's, it's awesome. I mean, literally, our store is only five hundred square feet. It yeah, doesn't. It was small. It was when I came in. It was. It's. It's a small space, but it's very cool. Y'all have used it very well. It's got a great vibe to it, uh, and y'all have a little of everything. That's that was another thing I really loved. It was like uh, walk in. There's some cool vintage amps. There's some sort of specialty stuff. Uh, a buddy of mine, Graham Howard's amps are there. Uh, y'all should definitely check out Howard Amps. Um, you know, that was actually how I heard about y'all was when Graham posted that his amps were in the shop and then heard RJ talk about it. I was like, okay, I'm definitely gonna have to stop by this store and see what's going on. Uh, RJ's got some pedals there in there on consignment. I, I'm pretty sure. Um, and the stuff that y'all have like ranges, um, from, you know, stuff that's near and dear to my heart, the like fifties, sixties, uh, you know, con uh, department store type stuff sears and k and silver tone and those kinds of stuff all the way up to uh there's one that i keep staring at on your website because i keep a tab on my phone open to your website and it's that uh 335 that y'all got in the store oh man man what a cool guitar but yeah y'all got a little of everything and it's not overwhelming so many music stores can be completely overwhelming yeah man i mean my kind of thought is you know when I go to somewhere like Chicago Music uh, <laughs> Chicago yeah. Music Exchange, I mean, it's an amazing place, but there's so much stuff that you just don't want to try anything. Yeah. Because you're like, I got to make the right move or something like that. And the kind of idea with our store, we're putting a lot of small boutique locally made brands, you know, into the spotlight, I guess, you know, for yeah. people to see while they're there. Because... The majority of our stuff uh, that is in there is boutique. I mean, yep. there's brands like Collision Devices, which as far as I know, you can only get from us in Chicago Music Exchange. Oh, that's uh, wild. And yeah, and that was when we were talking. When we were there, we were talking about different brands that y'all were trying to reach out to to get them in the shop. Because, you know, there's a lot of brands that aren't in a lot of places. Um, and I love that. I, I wanted to mention, though, with places like Chicago Music Exchange, I hate, and I love Chicago Music Exchange, so I'm going to preface that before I say this. I'm actually going to be in Chicago next month, just plan the trip, and I'm going to obviously stop by Chicago Music, Music Exchange while I'm there, but I hate having to ask a staff person to get a ladder to get a guitar down. I hate it. I don't want it in Guitar Center. I don't want it in Chicago Music Exchange. I don't want it in Righteous Guitars in Atlanta area. I, I don't want to have to ask, a, especially if I'm just trying things to see if I even like them. Like, I don't even, like, I'm, 
almost never walk into a guitar store anymore with the intention to buy something. And so I am a tire kicker until something blows me away. And I'll never know if it's going to blow me away until somebody gets it down and like, you know, risks life and limb to climb up on this 20 foot ladder and gets it down. And then I have to tell them, ah, you know, that's all right. <laughs> and here, take it back. Yeah. I mean, I get that. I mean, I'm that kind of person too. I've been to Guitar Center a couple times since we've opened and I'm like, okay, all these brands are very familiar. And, uh, um, with us, um, there are some familiar brands in there. So you're not completely like in the wild, you know, like there's some great brands like Catlin bread in there and JHS that we have on the shelves, but that's, I guess we don't want you to immediately go for that. We want you to discover, you know, something else something new something new but that's i mean we're still a place where you can get that kind of stuff yeah i actually my very first episode of this podcast before i started having guests i was talking about guitar center because it was just as they were filing bankruptcy uh and restructuring debt so they could stay open and i talked about the fact that we need stores like guitar center there needs to be like because i can go into a guitar center and let's let's imagine I'm in town playing a show and something wild. My amp fell out of the back of the truck and is completely busted. Can't get it to a tech. I know I can walk into a guitar center and I know they're probably going to have a twin reverb or a deluxe reverb or they're going to have, you know, an orange rocker 30 or something, you know, something like that, that, that brand everybody knows. I'm going to be able to pick up an amp that I can use and play the gig. If I absolutely had to, um, you can't always say that about smaller shops, which is good and bad. So yes, they're the Walmart of music stores, but you need that Walmart because they do, they do serve a purpose. So I I don't want anyone to think I ever hate on guitar center. I don't, I actually really think that we need guitar center to do well and survive, but that's where that whole niche thing, you know, you guys aren't filling that role. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're we're definitely small, and um, I like our little store just because I like that I like that mug. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I like this mug a lot. It's a good. Yeah, one. I uh, my coffee's a little strong tonight though. So, <laughs> yeah, man. The uh, as far as you know, being a bigger store, I just like maintaining the small space. And like you said, it kind of feels like a living room or like a man cave or something. Like there are all these like rad guitars and gear that you can try out. It's like going over to your friend's house that has a ton of gear and you get to try all this new stuff or like stuff you've seen on Instagram. You're like, dude, you have that. I mean, it's like, yeah, there's, there's no pretension when I walked in, there's no like, I was immediately comfortable with picking anything up to play. And that that's a cool vibe. You don't get that in every store. Um, Absolutely. I know a lot of stores where they'll have like the cheapy stuff where you could just grab it, but all like, like even like the okay stuff, like, oh, you've got the made in Mexico fenders behind a counter where you have to ask for it. And it's like, okay, that's a vibe. I'm not, not okay with this vibe. You know, yeah. it's a thing. Yeah, man. I mean, with our with our store, we're definitely trying to be welcoming and we want it to be a creative space. So we have, you know, people jamming all the time and customers will come in. We'll be like, OK, my dad turns on the Heritage SVT, <laughs> <laughs> starts jamming, you know, can't turn yeah. it up past three. Oh, uh, yeah, because you'll take the walls down with that thing. Oh, we already have. Yeah, we. <laughs> Yeah, we just uh we just got them repaired. No. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. And uh speaking of Graham, man, his amps are fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to have to get Graham on the podcast at some point. His his amps are a little ridiculously good. Um Yeah. Uh and uh I, sorry y'all, you missed y'all missed the time when he was making them and com- severely underpricing his amps. I'm pretty Ooh. sure he was selling his amps for a loss for a long time there. Yeah. But uh now uh 
He's been working on his getting his branding right. He's been working on, you know, really getting ready to roll out hardcore. But y'all have got uh, one of his deluxes, uh, deluxe style amp. I forget what it's called. It's got some options. And uh, the small mouth, small mouth Buffalo. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Those uh, are those are two very good amps. I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, I mean, at this point, when I'm when I'm going to play live, because my inspirations are people like Neil Young and, I mean, guys that just have these monster tweed deluxe tones. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I want to have a rad 50s tweed deluxe on stage with me. But then I plug into Grams and I'm like, does this seriously sound better? Because <laughs> it, I don't know what that man is doing. But those are awesome amps. Graham is Graham is a, a one. He's one of those rare birds in that what he he is an electronics technician engineer like by training, and, and that's not always common anymore. I actually had um, Barry from Grez Guitars on my last episode, and we talked about that because Barry is also an elect you know electronics guy by training. Uh, his background before he started building guitars was in electronics and acoustical design, like designing spaces. <clears throat> and um, that that feels like a generation ago. Uh, for me, for you, it's two generations ago where that was the norm that got into this industry because you were an electronics guy. And you learn like, there are so many uh, folks now who are like, oh, well, you know, I bought a kit from Mojo Tone. And uh, and just learned, I built the kit, and then I liked it, so I tweaked it, and then I, oh, that was fun, so I built another one, and so and so until I built an amp, um, and so they they didn't have the they didn't do the schooling, the learning, and that's fine. That I'm not disparaging that, but um, it's interesting because Graham has that background. I had him, and I I was real nervous about this. I didn't do it for. I've played the same Super Reverb. It's a 1970. I've had it since 2006, maybe. Wow. And so, yeah, I've, I've played that amp now for, you know, 16 years. And I, um, yeah, I know, longer than you've been alive. Uh, <laughs> you weren't going to say it, but that's okay. I'll say it. Um, and I love, I adore that amp. I've, I've loved it. And since the day I got it, the only thing that's ever been changed on it was I had to recone one of the speakers. I didn't do it, although I, th I think I'm going to learn to recone speakers. I think that'll be fun, and it's not something a lot of people are doing. Um, and two, I changed tubes in it one time before I took it up to Graham in 2020 um, and had him convert it to a black panel spec. And I, I agonized over it. I really did. I was like, oh, do I want to do this? Do I want to do this? Because it sounded so good as it was. Um, but no, it sounds unbelievable now it's it's ready for another uh how old is it now 60 no 52 years old math wow old. yeah and so it's ready for another 52 years of rocking absolutely and, uh, yeah graham does great work uh my hope is that he gets so busy building amazing amplifiers he can't be a tech anymore we'll be right back this podcast is supported in part by string joy strings I'm a snob, at least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where Stringjoy strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. Stringjoy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coded strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using Stringjoy strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy strings today. Absolutely, man. I think I think Graham has one of those boutique brands that is going to just take off as soon as it lands in the right hands. That's it. It's just uh, got to get the right player playing them. Absolutely. So do you see being in Nashville and being a small store in Nashville, do you get a, do you get a lot of traffic? Is there a lot of walk through? I realize you're not like hundreds of people a day walking through, especially with your space, but do you see a bunch of traffic? 
We do. Um, it's It's been surprising to say the least. We didn't promote our opening a lot. I mean, we did basic stuff like basic advertising, like we got in the Nashville scene and the East Nashvilleian and people were posting about us. So it was basically kind of word of mouth. Uh, it was a lot of people finding out about us through mutual friends. And we've had a lot of people come in uh, more than I would have thought. Yeah, Ab- absolutely. Uh, Do you see yeah. any of the uh, you see any of the known players come through? Uh, you know, you know what I mean when I say known players. Yeah, I. Uh, there's been some awesome people coming through. Some guys that I had no idea were even in Nashville, but they were. Uh, and then guys that would just come through, and I'm like, "That's who you are, huh?" <laughs> and, and <laughs> I mean. Yeah. There's nothing like seeing someone for the first time when you've known their name for a long time. Or, yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, I can put this together now. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, the uh, I was gone two days ago, I think. We were open. It was, or no, we were open Tuesday. No, Thursday. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. And, I'm uh, trying to remember what day everything is now, too. Me too. Yeah, my schedule's so mixed up. So it was a Thursday. I had to go to a meeting. uh, And so I wasn't at the shop. And I had some friends running it. They were covering for me that day. Yeah. And then they text me that uh, Bruce Springsteen's bass player was in the (laughs) shop. And, And I'm like, you're kidding me. I mean, I mean, that's cool. I mean, yeah, no, that's rad. I'm, I mean, we get some awesome people in there all the time, and that's we're, we're, so cool. You're in the right town for it. Absolutely, we're starting to get a lot of really cool session guys in there, mm-hmm. um, trying gear, and we're getting a lot of more brands in the store that are leaned towards the Nashville session player. I won't say much about it, but yeah. I'll I'll say they'll all be there in this upcoming fall. So. Nice. That's super cool. Hopefully none of them will get that 335 until I can figure out how I can get it. <laughs> God, money. I, I, I have too many guitars and not enough money. That's how it is. I don't, I, you know. Um, but it's, so it's funny how those stories work. Are you familiar with Morrison Brothers Guitars in Jackson, Mississippi? Um, I am not. That's fine. <clears throat> not actually too relevant for the story, except just to know that there's a music store, was a music store in Jackson named Morrison Brothers. For a long time, they were like the music store in Jackson, Mississippi, right? Years and years and years, they had the best techs, they had the best um, brands, everything. Well, they started in Cleveland, Mississippi, which is close to where I'm from. And uh, a guy I know, Ronnie Drew, who actually has a small shop in Clarksdale now, was buddies with the Morrison brothers, whose first names I can't even think of right now, but they they are the act you know the brothers Morrison, and uh, they opened their shop in Cleveland, and Ronnie used to play in a band with them, so they would leave their they would rehearse in the shop, and they would leave their gear set up so it looked like the store had more inventory than it actually had, and Ronnie played this like super cool, nineteen uh, seventy some odd JMP Marshall uh half stack and uh, it was set up in the store <laughs> one day ronnie uh gets a call from one of the morrison brothers said because because ronnie lived in clarksdale so he's in clarksdale and he got a call so they said ronnie he said yeah hey man what's up he said eddie van halen is in the store <laughs> in cleveland mississippi and ronnie's like oh that's awesome ronnie's not really a van halen guy you know but still he's like that's <laughs> awesome he said he wants to buy your amp ronnie said oh that's cool no <laughs> but it's like it's just that that small like somebody walking in that sort of blows you away that they're walking into your store uh rad stories like that i love those kinds of things yeah there's there's a few guys who as far as my music are heroes um some guys I'd love to see in the store at some point are people like Neil Young, man. Oh, that would be that would be so cool. Maybe he'd pick up a Howard Tweed. <laughs> oh, dude, I don't know. Uh, you know, Neil's got a, a a couple. He's got a couple of all right tweeds already in his collection. You know. Yeah. Um, he's holding those things together with spit and prayer. Um, 
<laughs> on the road because I'm sure he, he's the way he runs them. He's got to blow them up, right? They've got yeah. they've got to blow up regularly. I can't imagine the work that his tech goes through to keep them running on a. Oh tour. man. Because it isn't like it isn't like he switched over to like something more modern, like a Victoria or something like that, right? Or even a, a reissue. You know, they make the hand wound reissue tweed uh, deluxes now, and he's like, no, no, still taking these like fifty five or fifty six or whatever they are out on the road. It's a wild time. That's Absolutely. it's interesting that you're really into Neil Young. Is that something uh, that your dad was into that you got, or did you sort of find it on your own? My uh, my dad has seen Neil Young once or twice, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think he had, (laughs) the first time he saw him, I think Soundgarden was opening. Oh my gosh. And and it was maybe 1994. I can't remember the year that he said, but it was somewhere around there. And he said that it was one of the best shows he's ever been to. That's an interesting show. Soundgarden opening up for Neil Young. I love it. Yeah. And I mean... Finding Neil Young, I guess it was probably through Rockin' in the Free World, which I guess was my real introduction to Neil Young. I mean, just that, you know, E to D to, you know, C. I mean, it's... Oh, yeah. And then just uh, rock it loud. Absolutely. And his live performances are so unmistakable. I want to... uh I know scalpers will probably buy up all the tickets, but I want to go to Farm Aid this year, man. H- have you oh, seen the lineup? No, I haven't seen it yet. It's uh, Willie Nelson, Neil Young, Margot Price. Um, oh, man. And a ton of other people. I don't <coughs> know see. if they've announced any others since then. Yeah, I'm going to pull it up now just because that's what I do. Look things up on the podcast, you know. <laughs> that's, that's the way we do. So... Um, okay, here's the lineup that they've announced. Willie Nelson, Dave Matthews, John Mellencamp, Margot Price, Neil Young. So, uh, wow. there's, they said more to be announced later. So that's going to be a rad show. Dave Matthews is the one that sort of stands out there as the oddball a little bit. Yeah. But okay. I've seen Dave a few times live. Um, I saw him once. Uh, in Memphis at uh, what I affectionately refer to as Memphis in Mud, the Beale Street Music Festival, because uh, it rains every year. And um, they uh, they had Dennis Chambers playing drums for him oh, on man. that tour. And it was just mind-blowing how good they were. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I used to be, I'm a Dave fan. I'll say I'm a Dave fan, but I'm not like wild about Dave stuff. You know what I mean? There was a time, like, I like a couple of albums. I uh, hear him live, but just hearing Dennis and that band and uh, actually, no, no, I'm taking it back. I'm completely putting two together because Carter was still on drums there. Same year I saw Santana with Dennis Chambers on drums. Okay. That was, that makes more sense now, actually. Same year. That was a good year. That was a really good year. Um, I'm wondering if that's the same year I saw Foo Fighters at Memphis in May. Anyway, I see that's what happens when you get old. Uh, your mind <laughs> completely. You see enough live shows; they all start to run together. Right. Uh, so back up everything I just said. No, I saw Dave with Carter playing drums, and also Santana with Dennis Chambers. Um, I've never been to Farm Aid. Um, I, heck, I, even when I lived in Tennessee, I never went to Bonnaroo. Um, me either, man. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's too many people for me. It is too many people. I can't do it. I like small shows. I don't, I'm not a big fan of stadium shows anymore. Uh, the massive stuff, the massive crowds. Um, I just, I, I know this is so not rock and roll. I don't mind a place where we have seats. <laughs> That's okay with me. Yeah. Yeah. City Winery was great. You mean I can order my food on an app and don't have to stand in line at the bar? Oh, this, man. Oh, it's beautiful. You sit at your, you get, you buy your seat. There's a QR code on the table. You scan it. There's the menu. You buy it. They bring it to you. Yeah. It's I've, I've been to some great shows there. Um, Shannon McNally played there a few months ago. I know ago. Shannon. Yeah. Yeah, she's awesome. So, fun fact, my dad and Eric Deaton were part of her backing band. I, I knew your dad had played for her at one point. And of course, Eric, yeah. I've had Eric on the podcast as well. And Eric's a, such a That's rad awesome. dude. Um. 
Of course, Eric is right now on the road playing for the Black Keys, uh, which is wild to say. It's completely wild. I love I love Eric, and I'm so happy for him. Um, yeah, Shannon Shannon's great. Uh, I don't think she ever kind of got her due, although she's still out there doing it, so there's still time. You know, Kate Bush is out here topping charts again, so there's always time for Shannon. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I so, uh, oh, go ahead. Eric, um, playing with the Black Keys. There's some awesome stuff going on there because where where I learned to play bass, he was teaching there. It, it was it, it was in Oxford. The school's mm-hmm. called Roxford. If oh, you're in cool. Oxford that's a great little school that's uh that's where i learned to play bass uh newt rayburn was my first teacher uh that taught me the name i don't know him though he was in a local band called the cooters so they were (laughs) that's yeah that's a local band if i ever heard it (laughs) yeah i mean they uh they were uh it was a great school man um i'm sure they're still around but uh yeah when I uh, I was there from when I moved there to when I left, you know, here to go to Nashville. Um, but Eric was always a teacher there. Um, and it's surreal because on this tour, he's actually using the bass that he bought from us. Oh, is he really? He's using a, I think it's kind of like a vintage white um, precision bass from Fender. There's, there's nothing else you need in this world. I mean, it's, it's so surreal to see, you know, like a good friend like Eric, cause he played, we had an opening party at Vinyl Tap. We had, oh, okay. sh- we had Shannon play and then the Eric Deaton trio, which my dad was in that lineup for a, for a minute. He, uh, Wallace Lester. Yeah. And, uh, Eric. And That's they, so they brought me up for a song and I'm like, See, for me, I love Hill Country. Mm-hmm. There really hasn't been a new generation to take it on. One of the youngest guys that I know is still doing it, Cedric Burnside. Yeah, Cedric. He, Cedric's a monster. And I love he's, Cedric. he's awesome. His new record won a Grammy. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's crazy. And Step In is such an awesome song. Mm-hmm. I mean... Uh, you got Cedric and then... I, I, I don't know how old he is, but you got Lightning Malcolm out there doing it. Yep. Lightning's on the road with Tab Benoit right now. Um, they're they're killing it. Uh, of course, there's the North Mississippi All Stars. That's about the same age, you know. Right. That, that whole crew runs together though, so it's like once it's like there's this whole like group of people all doing it, and then they sort of splinter and all take it out. Hill yeah. Country is one of those things that I've played with some bands doing Hill Country before. I played with Bill Abel. I've played, I've actually played with Malcolm a couple of times. Uh, actually, I think it was, I can't remember if Cedric was playing drums for Malcolm at the time when I played. But uh, it's, I can jump in and I can play it, but I can't like lead a band in Hill Country because like it's so foreign to me and it's, I, I don't translate it well. Um so, listeners, if you're not familiar with Hill Country Blues, I'm going to tell you, oh, you can ignore all these people we just talked about. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. <laughs> you need to go listen to R.L. Burnside, Hip Pocket Full of Whiskey, and you need to go listen to Junior Kimbrough, Anything by Junior Kimbrough. Anything. Yeah, absolutely anything. And then, then also find you some T-Model Ford. Uh, get into T-Model Ford. It is, all of it is raw. All of it is raucous. All of it is lewd, but it is all absolutely some of the most, uh, it is some of the grooviest music you will ever listen to in your life. It borders on blues trance music. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. I uh, When I listened to your episode with Rhett, I mean, y'all described it perfectly. <coughs> I believe you said it. You were like, if it was any more, like if it was in time and tight, it just yeah. wouldn't it wouldn't have the feel yeah, that, it that that it does. Cause Junior Kimbrough, <laughs> I listened to a song called All Night Long, and it's yeah. just dude, the drums are kind of on beat. And then and then and then he the one word he says from my memory is like All Night Long. And, and yeah. then it, it's just the rest of the song is just him noodling on guitar completely out of tune. Uh huh. 
I mean, there was not a tuner in the house. I mean, but but that's that's the so thing. I'm going to tell you a fun story about tuning and Hill Country Blues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> First of all, in fact, I can't remember if I told this story on the episode with Rhett, because we did go down quite the Hill Country Blues rabbit hole there for a minute. Um, but first of all, it's because the music is like it because it was music that wasn't meant to be pretty and perfect. It was meant for something that you could celebrate and have a good time to. And it breathes. It actually it moves and it lives with the crowd. Like Hill, listening to Hill Country on records, I only do it because I have to. Because the best way to listen to it's in the house live when it's happening. Because it is meant to make you move. Um, but tuning in Hill Country is an interesting thing. Uh, every you know, most people want to play you know, in tune. That's a thing that we want to do. But I used to, so I used to run sound uh, as the audio engineer at Ground Zero Blues Club in Clarksdale. And Great place. I had this one particular guy, Robert Belfour, Robert Wolfman Belfour, who would come through, uh, and and like so many others, he is gone now. But um, he was sure. He was sure that I could change the tuning of his guitar from the soundboard. He was sure that I was messing up the tuning of his guitar. <laughs> and I, it could be very well that what he meant was tonally he didn't like what he was hearing. But he called it tuning, and I took it to mean he thought I was changing the tuning of his guitar. And it wasn't just me. It was any sound guy. He would tell them not to mess with the tuning of his guitar. And it's like... It's a wild time in, in Hill Country, man. It because you know they're playing through whatever they can get a hold of a lot of times. Because this is this is music much like original blues, the 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 other styles of blues that we associate. It came out of poverty, and it came out of playing whatever they could get their hands on. Sometimes that's playing a Sears guitar that he can't get into tune properly or hold it for very long through a home stereo, through the through the aux input of a home stereo. You know, yep. it's whatever they've got. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, I've seen bridges like this, like just slanted. Oh, yeah. It's awful. I'm like, how how do you play like this in the string? So the fretboard is here. And uh -huh. if this is audio only listeners, I'm sorry, but it's <laughs> like, it's like two inches, maybe. Yeah. Uh, off off the fretboard. I'm like, this is almost a slide guitar. Oh no! I mean, it, it is or should be at that yeah, point. At, at that point, I mean, I don't, I don't think many guitars are worth smashing. But I mean, if <laughs> if, if if you can't get it to work, you know, if, if it's just beyond repair, you need to have an awesome music video and just <laughs> smash it and just smash it. I we did that. Uh, my fraternity's music fraternity. Um, we did that as a fundraiser one year, and we. We most people were excited about it and thought it was fun. Some people, you know, were like smashing a piano. We we got a piano that was in complete disrepair. Like <laughs> was not worth repairing. You know, one of these good old fashioned uh, upright console pianos that's been sat around in a storage unit and it's like completely irreparable. Or it's not worth the money it would cost to repair. It's like, oh, the piano's worth a couple hundred bucks. It would take like twelve hundred bucks to get it working it's like that's right. not worth it and so we did a fundraiser where people got uh, swings with a hammer to smash it we raised a lot of money um that's awesome yeah no it was great and also i think somebody took the once it was all smashed and splintered somebody actually took the metal sound the metal the the stringing mechanism and took it and turned it into some art so it still got to live on as something wow. so um yeah, hill country is a thing, but you know we we're we're like forty minutes in this episode. And I wanted to definitely talk about. So you're playing music as well. You've released some music. I just saw you were singing at a fundraiser as well. Your dad posted video. Um, so let's talk about the music you're making and and uh, it's available on Spotify. For it is okay. Um, well, I'd say my uh my music. It's very interesting. I don't even know how to describe it, really. It's kind of a mix of a ton of influences from the music that was kind of being brought to me at a young age. So the one, I think I only have one on Spotify right now. It's called Make Believe. Okay. It's it's a very interesting song. 
I mean, it's really the same chord progression until the chorus and through the rest of the song. And so fun fact, I recorded that with a, uh, a good friend, Jimbo Hart. Uh, oh, he's yeah. A, he's a great bass player. Yeah, he is. And he laid down the bass on that track, and it is so awesome. And uh, 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 for those of you that uh, that name's just flying by, Jimbo Hart would be the bassist for um, Jason Isbell and the 400 unit. Uh, just to put that in perspective, yeah, I think he knows a thing or two about playing bass. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's he's one of the best bass players for playing that kind of music, period. Yeah, I, I mean, I've so I got to see him live right after we recorded that song, and I'm like. He played as good as he played on my record, man. I mean, he's just got this energy, and it's awesome. That man has got vibe when you see him live. He Absolutely. Is, he does not sit still, and I love it. Absolutely. Uh, he's, he's a punk rocker in an alt-country Americana band. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so you've got that track out. You've got uh, plans to record an EP or a whole album? Yes. So... What I'm currently working on is the, I guess, debut record uh, yeah. for my solo project. Um, and it's it's got a lot of, I'd say, a mix of Neil Young, some Americana vibe to it, um, it's it's not heavy, but it has the hard rock because that's a lot of my background oh, from sure. bands that I've been in. I mean, growing up, I was listening to like. So I started with Rufus Thomas and okay. Stax Records. The first song I ever loved and knew every word for word was "Funkiest Man Alive" by Rufus <laughs> Thomas. I, I, I was like one o'clock in the morning, I'm funky, like in the back of the car when I'm like four. There's an, there's an awesome video online of it. Um, and then um, it's, I mean, it's crazy because I went from that to a few years ago, I listened to a band called System of a Down. Yeah. I was into really heavy drop tuning. That's and then a, I, That's a big transition from Rufus Thomas to System yeah, of a Down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it wasn't all immediate. Uh, but it was, I've, I've been through several music phases and now I'm kind of back to like Stax records and like Isaac Hayes, man. Yeah, dude. Hot Butter Soul is one of the coolest records that has ever come out. If, if you see a record that has the Stax label on it, you need to listen to it. That's just yep. the way it works. Hey, look, Motown's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it, it'll, it'll do in a pinch. Yeah. But if you want to hear some funky Southern soul, you listen to Stax records. Yep, Walk On By is one of the, you know, most, I'd call it one of the staples of Stax Records, or, uh, what was that, High Records. So, High Records, Al Green. Right. Rufus Thomas, Stax Records, and then Isaac Hayes, was he on Volt, or? Oh, let me see. I, I think he was on Stax, actually. Yeah, he was um, on Stax. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the the whole Isaac, Memphis so so Stax Records is Memphis Soul is the best way to talk about it, and Absolutely. Isaac Hayes was Memphis Soul, like that's his that was his thing. Um, I don't know if he was only on Stax though, so maybe there was a period when he wasn't. Okay, this is me not knowing my history the way I probably <laughs> should. Yeah. Um. So, but yeah, that's where he, that's where he started. That's like, for all the stereotypical, that's where the Shaft theme song was recorded. Uh, yeah. Wikipedia is telling me from 63 to 74, he was on Stax. And then okay. he moved in 74 and, uh, and then from 77 to another period, he was on Polydor. But yeah, Stax is where he did his best work, in my opinion. You can Absolutely. take it or leave it, you know. Absolutely, man. And I think uh, that's the kind of easy listening music for me. I mean, <laughs> Isaac Hayes, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, Neil Young, um, a lot of great 
you know, musical influences that have a lot in common. They're trying to get a message across right? Uh, about issues that they want to be worked on. And you ball all that up and add, you know, kind of my generation to it. And I guess that's where the new music is. Yeah, uh, no, that makes a lot of sense. Because I've been recording on, uh, I've been recording on the 335. Ah, uh, yeah. God, that guitar is so good. Yeah. That guitar is so good. Yeah, I'll save it for you. <laughs> I know. Don't do that. That's a bad business decision because you might be holding it for a while. <laughs> oh, man. When when I'm recording, it's just... So I'm using Graham's amp on the demo right now. Oh, really? Yeah. And so I've got some stuff. So Neil Young uses a tuning where it's D, A, D, G, uh, B, D. Oh yeah, yeah. So he does the double drop D thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's awesome. Like I I, I can't play slide for my life right now, <laughs> uh, but I'll play a song like Cortez or like Ohio or something like yeah. that. And I'm like, I feel so awesome right now. And <laughs> I, I've like completely dialed in his tone. There's this Catlin Bread pedal, the Formula Fifty Five. Yeah, I cannot crank because there's offices below the shop so and sometimes they're there late at night they told me so i'm like okay (laughs) i'm i'm here 11 at night let's just get the full tone of the amp yeah so i i put the master all the way down i crank the uh volume of the pedal but i leave the amp at one it's still hella loud yeah and I just crank and get that full, you know, fifties tweed sound. Yeah, it's uh, such a it's such a cool sound that fifties tweed thing. My only my only issue with it, I have to have reverb. I don't I can't play <laughs> without reverb. And uh, Victoria makes a really cool um, tweed deluxe style amp that has reverb built into it. I forgot what they yeah. call it. It's like the Vicky Verb, maybe. Yeah, maybe that's it. I almost called it the double deluxe. No, that's a two twelve deluxe. But um, yeah, they've got a cool variation on it that has reverb on it. That's my one and only. That's the only thing I don't like about the tweed amps is like I've got to have reverb. I've got to right. have it because that's my that's my old school blues influence coming in. Like that's like my BB King and my Albert King love. Where it's just absolutely like, how how wet can I make this reverb? How much can I crank it up and not just feedback? So. And that's one thing I love about the store is because not only is it a great place for people to get together, but when I want something to do late at night, I'm like 9 p.m. I need to make some music. Like, yeah, I just I I just get this wave, you know, some days where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to the shop right now. And so I'll go there. I plug in all these different pedals and I find the sound. So my pedal board right now, very simple. Uh You know, I'm, I have, you know, like the helix set up and everything, but that's, that's just really not my sound. I'm, I'm, I'm using an RC booster. Great pedal. pedal. Oh, it's, it's overlooked today in the day of like all the boutique pedals we have access to, but yeah, incredible pedal. It's it's the Nashville Session Legend, really. I mean, you you got that and the ODR yep. from uh from Noble. Or uh yeah. Yeah, it's Noble. Or is it Nobles? I think it's one, Noble. One of them makes that pedal, the other makes the bass preamp that everybody uses, and I get them mixed up every time. And Nobles is also the restaurant right next to our shop. <laughs> <laughs> that too. That's a yeah. totally different thing as well. Absolutely. But uh you should go in there and try to order an ODR one just to see what happens. Oh Lord. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> Overdraft one. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. That's, those are the Nashville. Those are the Nashville drives. That's what everybody's using. Um, it's, it's gotta be nice to have a shot where you have access to all the, the stuff that's coming through there and can try everything out. I did the helix thing too. And it's just not for me. It, it yeah. sounds good. It's not that it sounds bad. It's just not my thing. Yeah, I've just, I've, cancel me if you want. I'm tired of seeing people use like the whole Kemper setup with no cabinets, no stage volume, because it feels so empty. The bass is awesome because you have it going through the PA and the subs and there's plenty of, 
you know, volume for the, you know, guys with monitors. But I'm like, the guitars just sound so thin and I I will never go digital. I mean, I don't care if they stop making tubes. I'm going to spend all the <laughs> money I can on getting tubes and I'm going to keep them up. rocking. That's, I mean, because there's nothing I, like a tube amp. No. And, well, I had this discussion with uh, someone else recently. I don't think it was on the podcast. This is what happens when you record enough episodes of the podcast. You don't remember what you talked about on the cast <laughs> and not on the cast. But yeah. The thing with the, that modelers are still working on is the high end. Like the everything, I'm not going to try to put a, a, a frequency on it, but I'm I'm thinking it's everything above, I don't know, 2K? Everything above 2K? Uh, 2.5K? They still don't quite have right. It just doesn't sound, it doesn't come across the right way for me. Does it sound great? Does the... Does the quad cortex sound good? Does the heat? They all sound great. I've played all of them at this point, except the Axe Effects. Have not come across one to try out. I've tried all the others. I've I've used uh, the Helix a lot live. It sounds good, and and it worked in like musicals where the guitar is not the feature, or it worked in like uh, church gigs, and it worked in show choirs. It worked stuff where that wasn't a big deal. But if I'm playing blues americana rock and roll where the guitar is the thing i need the real deal i need the real thing uh there's a reason uh heavy metal players really gravitate towards the 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 digital options because it can do those frequencies that heavy metal likes really well if i were play if i were doing hard rock or heavy metal or any of that kind of stuff i absolutely would be playing a helix or a quad cortex and some type of i'd still want stage volume so i'd have some kind of powered cab you know the power cab or like some other kind of speaker solution but i think it does those sounds incredibly what it doesn't do as well is that clean or edge of breakup it gets the sound but it has none of the the, the um, je ne sais quoi, yeah. that lanyap, that little bit of extra that it does in a real tube amp. Absolutely. And nothing against, you know, kind of that whole genre because I love metal. I was listening to Dream Theater the other night. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's so weird because I still go back to their records, even though, you know, it's just crazy. Like seven string guitars and six string basses and Mike Mangini playing those drums sounds like a <laughs> drum machine. Yeah. Uh, it's, but it's I mean, so outside my concept of what is real. Like it doesn't sound like it's created by human beings to me at some points. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's alien music and, yeah, and, and what, music. and what some people have called it that I've seen. And I'm like, that's oh, awesome. Yeah. You need to you need to look up on YouTube actually cuz I just thought about it for the second time so now I'm going to actually say it. There's this really cool version of Cortez the Killer on YouTube with Steve Vai. Um is it is it Vai? No, I'm sorry. It's Satriani. It's Satriani okay. on guitar. Um I'm going to see if I can find it and just tell you all the players on it cuz uh yeah, hold on. The guy looks up things on the internet on a podcast. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there it is. It's, uh, let me see if I can mute this tab so it doesn't start playing immediately when I click on this so I can get <laughs> the uh, the listing of musicians. Oh my gosh, nope. Okay. It's got Grace Potter on keys and singing, Joe Satriani, Steve Kimmick, Reed Mathis, Willie Waldman, and Stephen Perkins. It's the wildest version doing Cortez the You got to check that out. You'll appreciate it. That's and, an interesting lineup. Yeah, for and sure. If you don't think Satriani can play with some soul? He absolutely can play with soul, and he does on that on that that recording. Absolutely. Um, so, before we wrap up, because we're we're approaching the end of the regular episode, uh, want to cover. So when you play live, you've got access to some stuff. Obviously, there's some stuff in the store. What's your setup though? What are you playing live when you play live? Like, what do you so, play? Part of the difficulty of the store is not be taking stuff home. Yeah, uh, because 
I'm like, man, this would be perfect for the live rig, but you know, we got to stay with the shop. And, (laughs) and, and, and I'm like, you know, this is part of going into it, but I finally kept something and it's my 1971 Gibson SG. Oh, nice. And, and it's, it's so weird, man. I mean, it's like almost like a walnut color, but it's, it's still got like a red, you know, yeah, color, but it's almost to the point where it's just brown. That's uh, that, like that's walnut. that 70s SG. That's that color I associate with the, with the 70s. Yeah. I have a friend of mine has a 71 335 and it's that brown walnut that yeah. just with the embossed, does yours have the embossed pickup covers on it? It was such a weird, I mean, it's because it's actually mini humbuckers. Oh. And, and and it has black pickup covers. So it's... Oh, that's wild. Yeah. Um, it's really, I don't even know, but it's it's all original. I mean, it was from the case, had some wear from being, you know, what, 51 years old yeah. now? And uh, I mean, just oh, some... Oh, is that the uh, SG Special? It's either a special or a deluxe. It might be a special. Yeah. Um, it's it's very interesting though because they only did that for a year, I think. Yeah. That, that's that specific pickup cover. Did you um, have the harmonica bridge as they call yep. it? Yep. Yeah. It's it's very interesting, and even though it's got that pickup configuration, I plugged in again to Graham's amp. Uh huh. Put up the Formula Fifty Five because we sold the Sabra Cadabra. <laughs> uh, from, from Catlin Bread, and I played the hell out of Children of the Grave really? by uh, by uh, Black Sabbath, and it just worked. And I know he uses a Laney Ironheart and like a Dalid Range Master or whatever it's called, and his monkey, you know, I think it's a P90 SG. Uh, I, you know, I maybe. don't know actually. I'm. I like Sabbath, but I never really got like deep enough into the guitar playing to like get into his gear because it was like that's one of those styles of music that I appreciate, but I never emulate, right? Kind of thing. But that's a cool that's a cool tone. So you're you're playing an SG and a vintage SG at this point, seventy one mini humbuckers. Yeah. Uh, do what amp do you use, or are you just taking grams out when you go? You know, if at this point, you know. Cause I had I had a very rare Princeton amp. It mm-hmm. was a, I think it was a '68 reissue. It had blue, uh, it had blue, you know, covering. Okay. Uh, like blue tweed, um, and there were only 200 of them made. Oh, cool! And I sold it, uh, which was you know in the original iteration of Call of Guitars when we were selling online. Mm-hmm. Um. It was very interesting, but now I'm trying to go after a 50s tweed amp. Oh, which man, I've I've sold everything, but it's it's going to take a lot more to get one of those because yeah, the, the prices on those have gone through the roof. Absolutely, the cheapest one I see online right now is at uh, Mike's in Seattle. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Mike and Mike's and, Guitar Bar. Yeah. And it's seventy five hundred, mm. and I'm like, my lord! And the reason I say I want a fifty nine is because they did something special that year. So the Jensen they had in it, yeah, the, like because I think they changed up the circuit a little bit at uh, some point, and that's also the year that uh, I think that's the year model that Neil Young used again. Neil Young coming yeah. in. Uh, but it was the same exact speaker model that he had. It was the same, you know, or original wiring, no modifications. I mean, because it's impossible to find those amps, oh, like yeah. in in good condition, because they've they've gone from that tweed color to like it's been sunken underwater <laughs> yeah. for two hundred years. So much beer spilled on it, and all the modifications and so many repairs. And I'm like, <laughs> at this point, just stop. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And do you ever listen to um? Do you ever listen to the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast? I haven't. 
that you sounds should, interesting. You should check that out. So Jason Verlindi over at Fretboard Journal okay. um, has a couple of podcasts. He has one that's like uh, Truth About Vintage Amps. He's got one yeah. where he talks to luthiers, or I say he. Really, he more facilitates it, and he has a host for each of these iterations of podcasts. On okay. Truth About Vintage Amps, it's a guy by the name of Skip Simmons, who is a tech out of California. He's probably seen more tweed amps than anyone else on the planet. Um, Man. fixing them out of California. And he talks about this kind of thing where he's like, stop modding these vintage amps. Like, yes, there was a period where it just got done. He's like, cause his big thing is like, why do you want to mod it? And he talks about fixing amps. He's like, before you start, <clears throat> before you even talk about modding it, when you get something that needs repair, fix it, make it work like it meant to work and then see if it actually needs anything else. And, you know, yeah. don't try to make it what it isn't. Just get the thing you want instead of making something what it's not. And so he he talks about that. He's a wealth of information on those on those uh, vintage tweet amps. It's also just a fun podcast. They talk about food a lot, and they talk about a lot of other things, too. And they go long. Sometimes they're like two and three hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good road trip and podcast. I'm, I'm familiar with those links of podcasts yes. for sure. And uh, as far as gear, so... My pedal board again is just the RC Booster and El Kappa stand. I'm going to get a Super Trim from, uh, what's that company? Full Tone. Oh, Full Tone. Yeah, the Super yeah. Trim. That's yes. a good one. So one of those again and uh, a Ghost Echo. Oh, yeah. So that's that's all that's on there. I mean, that's all the effects I'm using. Yeah. Uh, and if, if I can't crank the amp, then I'll bring the Formula 55 along. Yeah, because... Uh, because y'all, a, a Tweed Deluxe, maybe low wattage, it is still loud as hell. It is the loudest amplifier you can get. I mean, it, it, it'll, it'll rip it'll, the paint off walls. Yeah, I mean, these are the amps that, <laughs> when, when I say these names, these are national touring acts. Uh -huh. Billy Gibbons yep. uses a 50s Tweed. Mike Campbell uses a 50s Tweed. Neil Young, loudest concerts ever, uses a 50s Tweed. Mm-hmm. These amps are loud as hell, and they're 18 watts, as far as I know. 18 watts. I mean, and that list, I mean, I'm going to add some other very classic players that, that used it. You know, you've got Scotty Moore, Larry Carlton, Don Felder. Uh, there's, it was a classic, and they're that expensive for a reason, because Absolutely. that's the sound. I had a, I had a Victoria 2112 for a while, and... Uh, what a killer amp that was. And I traded it off because I wasn't needing it at the time. Um, I may or may not have another tweet amp on its way to me right now. Um, just because it's a thing. It's it's a sound you got to have. I think everyone needs to experience it. It is not going to be everyone's thing. But it is. It's loud and it hurts. <laughs> and it's so yeah, good. man. And yeah. If, if And the tip for those of you like me that need reverb. If you plug into one channel. Take the other input of that channel run it into a uh, reverb pedal and then run it into the input of the other channel now you've got an effects loop for your reverb so you can dial use the other channel's volume knob to dial in your reverb it works beautifully that's interesting yeah yeah it's, it's, it's old school trick people used to do it with marshals too as someone as soon as you know someone besides tone king comes up with a tweed <laughs> amp that has a good attenuation system. I don't care if it's like a hybrid master or whatever they do to keep the full tone of the amp. Yeah. But you can just use it without shaking, you know, the hell, you know, out of your home or stage or whatever it is, you know, just for practical use. I'd They're like going to make a lot of money. Uh, Victoria makes one, but I'd like to see somebody else. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to hip you to an amp brand real quick. And then we're going to close this episode and go over to the, uh, the Patreon episode for a little bit. And, uh, Alrighty. but, uh, Victoria makes one, uh, H they make a champ and a Harvard, uh, remake. I, I don't want to call them a clone, but they're, they're that style of amp. One's just a volume. I can never get this right. One's a tweet amp with just a volume. One's volume and tone. Uh, and they're about five watts. And so I think five watts for that at your house when you need to crank it or you want to do it in the studio 
is the perfect volume. The one thing I hate about those amps is they come with like an eight or a 10 inch speaker. And at that low wattage and cranking, I want a 12. So there's an amp company called Grease, 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 G-R-I-E-S. Go on dude's website, check it out. He makes a, um, I'm going to look it up right now. He makes a little uh, 50, uh, 60 style amp, both of them, that is just a head. And it is five watts. Um, it's, it's essentially a champ. But then he adds the EQ section from a black panel amp. That's um, interesting. So it's a three band EQ and a volume knob, and it is five watts. And it, it he now he makes a traditional one where it's just the volume, if that's what you want, right? If you just want a volume, um, but he makes one that has a three uh, three band EQ, and it is four ninety nine. It, you will not find a handmade tube amp, small wattage, five, in a head. He, he uses good quality components for $500. That is unheard of. Yeah, it's unheard of. Y'all go buy him out because uh, he's making really cool amps. <laughs> Man. And that you could crank. For sure. Yeah, and I want to say if, if you're trying to buy a tweet amp, so you've got a couple of options there. So of course, you know, if you like Fender, you just like the name plate, then yeah. you know what? Go for, you know, the 57. Uh, I know Rhett has one. Uh, yeah, he does. Cause, yeah, because we were talking about it because when I was talking to him about, you know, discovering the tweet amp for me, he's like, yeah, I use this one and I like it. And I'm like, okay, I'll look into it more. Uh, so that's a good one. Graham's, just another level. Yeah. Uh, you know, Graham's for me, has a couple of options on it, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. You can, uh, he'll, he'll build you anything really. Um, but that, that amp in particular is pretty amazing. The one that we have tungsten yeah. tungsten. My dad had a, uh, cream of wheat for a long time. Oh man. That's a brand I completely forgot about that it's like a 70% 5e3 30% plexi kind of thing. So yeah. they t they took a little base out of it and gave it a little more clarity. Um and it's it's a great amp. I know uh Victoria makes some great stuff. Yeah, Mark over there at Victoria is a, a great dude and makes a good amp. Absolutely. And one of the things I like about Victoria that they do like the old Fenders did. So if you open up a Victoria you will find the name of the woman who put your amp together in the inside of the amp. Wow. Which is what Fender used to do. You know, the person who built that amp, their name would be in there. And I say woman. I don't know that Victoria is all women doing this, but I do know the one I had had a woman's name, and I wish I could remember it right now, but it had a woman's name in the amp who put it together. Yeah. It's, such yeah, a, it's, it's a small touch that most users will never see. They'll never open it up to see that, you know, but it's a nice touch. Absolutely. And, you know, as far as my gear, the last thing that I really have, mm -hmm. um, I guess right now I'm using a, uh, a Gretsch Vintage Select, uh, I think it's a 62 reissue Chet Atkins Tennessee Rose. Ooh, that's and cool. And those are amazing guitars. Yeah. I, some dude came in, he wanted to do a trade, and I'm like, you've got me sold. That's the same way I got the SG. Yeah. And they're the same tint and everything of color. Really? And it's so, and it's so weird. <laughs> it, it's like this maroon, almost brown kind of thing. And, and it's awesome. And those are great guitars, man. I mean, that's cool. We had our tech set it up and it just plays like butter. Like it's, it's got the Gretsch sound, but then it plays like a modern guitar. Uh, oh, that's so rad. And yeah, then I, I I'm getting into the Gretsch hype lately. I'm getting Absolutely. And then uh, Dave Dave Cobb has, I guess, my dream Gretsch, which is a Firebird Jet. Those yeah. guitars are incredible. And he has a Bigsby on his. And those 50s Bigsbys are... Did they make those in the 50s? Or is that a is that a mod? I think they had Bigsbys yeah, back you, then. Yeah, you, you can find a, a Bigsby in the 50s. You absolutely okay. can. 
because yeah. the uh, the fifty seven Gibson Les Paul Custom with the three humbuckers has a Bigsby on right. it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was just making sure yeah. that I that I wasn't saying something. Yeah. Your that timeline. I'll get, getting the timeline right. Yeah. I'll I'll get called out on that. Look, it's fine. You have lots of time to learn all of these dates and times. The exam isn't until next week. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. Uh, we're gonna wrap up here on the regular episode. Thank you, listeners, for hanging out with us. Thank you, Silas, for coming on the show, talking about your shop and your music you're making. I think it's really cool what y'all are doing. Uh, I'd be just, I'd be scared to death opening a music store in Nashville, but you know, <laughs> it's really awesome that y'all are. It's so great to meet y'all. Um, I'm going to take a second to thank all of my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much. Uh, at the, uh, uh, I don't, I don't actually have title. Uh, I do medium wattage because uh, you know I'm, I'm super kitschy like that. My medium wattage supporters or producers are Kyle Benton, Scott Hamilton, Annie Koenig, uh, Jim Burns, Tom Kelly, Heath Bat, Rick Calhoun of Honey Picks. David Ishizaka, Jeffrey Walks, and Kyle Harris, and a special thanks to executive producer at the high wattage level, uh, Ben Fair. Uh, appreciate y'all's support. Y'all help make sure this podcast keeps happening and that uh, I don't have to go into my gear fund to pay all of the uh, overhead costs for running this podcast, and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to help support the podcast, go over to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast. You can read about all the perks there. Uh, you can support at a bunch of different levels, all the way from $3 to $50 a month, whatever you want to do. Every every dollar helps. Uh, right now, I'm I'm as of this month, I am almost breaking even. I'm almost not losing money on this podcast. So the next supporter or two will push me over the edge, and I really appreciate that. Um more supporters means I can start buying some gear, the like audio and video gear, and maybe actually make this look good because this lighting is terrible. Um, maybe a camera I'll actually look at in, you know, when I'm putting this on YouTube. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. done rambling. Y'all, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Silas, for being here. Thank until you. next <laughs> until next time, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and make some noise. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free, as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons, and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.